वेलकम एंड वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल हम सहला सेक्रेटरी ऑफ आईट्रिपली सी एस एम ए एस पी सी इट्स अ वंडरफुल डे एंड आई फील वेरी एक्साइटेड एंड प्रिविलेज टू एक्सटेंड माई वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल प्रेजेंटेड हियर थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस फॉर टूडेज वेबिनार ऑन द टॉपिक क्वांटम कंप्यूटिंग कंडक्टेड बाय आईट्रिपली सी एस एम ए एस पी सी रिसोर्स बाय मिस्टर महेश बाबू To talk about Mr. Mahesh Babu, he is a quantum computing expert and A4 analyst at Cape Gemini. He is also a final year B.Tech student in the College of Engineering, Patanapuram. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Mahesh Babu as the resource person and esteemed guest of the webinar. Welcome, sir. Next, I would like to welcome a honourable counsellor of IEEE MESB, Mr. Jamshir Ahmed. Welcome, sir. I welcome IEEE CS MESPC advisor Mr Muhammad Shamim P welcome sir I also welcome Mr Muhammad Musharraf chair of IEEE MESB and I extend my warm welcome to all other executive and non executive IEEE members and other esteemed audience present here So now let's get started I invite our honorable guest and speaker of the day Mr Mahesh Babu for the presentation over to you sir Thank you, Sahla, and uh, thanks to Aisha for inviting me uh, to this occasion. So, without wasting any time, let's begin. I hope the. Slide is visible to you guys. Yes, it is, sir. You can proceed. Okay, okay. Thank you. And uh, so, uh, I welcome you all to this journey into the world of quantum computing. So, first of all, I would like to ask you one question: Is it possible to predict the future? Uh, excuse me, sir. Your voice is too low. Uh, you are having difficult with the voice. Uh, there is raining here. That's a problem. I'm having some problems. Uh, is it okay that I turn off my audio video? Yes, absolutely, sir. Okay, thank you. So, uh, is that, am I audible now? Ah, yes, sir. It will be nice if I, it's a yes, bit sir. more. Okay. Uh, so, moving on to the session. Uh, i asked a question whether is it possible to predict the future any opinions from your side uh i uh, sir can you uh, see the chat box yeah yeah uh, all right you guys can uh, just turn on your mic and uh, say it no problem at any time okay you guys are saying no so i'm going to tell you it is possible but how it is possible then uh, that will be going to discuss in the session okay so uh, the agenda of today's webinar will be three things first one why do we need quantum computing uh, the second one is what is quantum computing and the third one is how does quantum computing help us So um, this is a famous saying by Richard Feynman. He says that I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Uh, do you have any guesses why he said like that? Uh, okay. So uh, according to Feynman, the area of quantum mechanics or quantum computing is very weird. Like uh, it's. something not a common person can uh, understand with a very easy thing so let me show you three movies that feature this quantum computer the first one is transcendence have anyone seen the movie transcendence okay i don't think anyone has responded so okay uh, transcendence was a movie by jack sparrow you know jack sparrow uh the pirate of caribbean yeah his movie he in that movie they talk in extensions about quantum computing uh yeah safana seen okay okay 
thank you guys for responding and it talks in elaborate about quantum computing how human mind can be stored in a computer and what are all the things uh, and also in avengers we see time traveling and and when we see shrinking to a small size we all think that this is not possible um, but let me tell you everything is possible and with quantum computing we can achieve this otherwise impossible feat so uh, coming to your uh, your standpoint you may be thinking we have classical computers which are far superior than uh, other anything we have known like super computers are there why do we need quantum computers so in we need to answer that question we need to look upon something called moore's law in 1965 uh, gordon e moore that is he was founder of intel he postulated that every two years the processing capacity of the processors will increase double fold that is like if we have a processor and capacity of two gigahertz in a year within two years it will be four gigahertz but actually uh, our progress was not that in that same manner but we are reaching to a point called peak the peak point is in definition that uh, beyond that point like Uh, it was said that in the year 2020 the moore's law becomes so valid that we can't build a powerful processor powerful processor no more than uh, that we could with the energy that we are providing to it so uh, we reached 2020 but still nothing has happened and we are living in an era called a post moore's law uh, according to the latest news by amd and intel who are the chip manufacturers they uh, claim to have adapted a process called 2 nanometer process so what is 2 nanometer process you may be thinking 2 nanometer process is a fabrication process in which the size of the chips are 2 nanometer in length that is they are so small so small in the fact that you can't shrink it more the reason because of that is that when you are talking about a chip what does a chip is made up of it is made up of transistors so in order to make transistors you need silicon so beyond that 1 nanometer or 2 nanometer point you can't shrink because it's the size of an atom so what happens is that when we try to make a smaller now i mean like a smaller size of transistor there occurs a problem called the tunneling effect i'll explain what the tunneling effect is so that is the problem and uh, we are having processors with 64 core you may have heard amd is thread ripper model they have around 500000 transistors and uh, what happens is that as we are trying to fit a large number of transistors into the chip the amount of heat generated will be very large it will be more than the amount of energy that we are supplying to the chip that means it won't be possible to shrink it further or create a smaller chip we have to go big going big means that it's okay but in the case of a consumer point of view it's not it requires a large amount of energy and as you know we are in an energy crisis it's not possible that is one reason next what happens is the tunneling effect so let me give you an example mm, the tunneling uh, so imagine this there are two conductors like two wires and they are close to each other so uh, there are electrons flowing through these two wires and what happens is that when you shrink the electrons smaller smaller to a very small size the gap between those two wires needed for the electron to escape becomes very small so they escape from one conductor to another what that causes is error we call that error in terms of computing it causes a lot of errors called quantum tunneling errors so due to this we can't shrink any more transistors and that's one of the reason why we have to implement quantum computing i hope this is clear to you if you have any doubts or queries in this session uh, please inform okay so moving on to the next slide so uh, just because we can't shrink any more transistors doesn't necessarily mean we can't do any more 
like we need a quantum computer so what are the other reasons why we need a quantum computer uh, the first one is optimization problem so let us take an example i hope you are familiar with the traveling salesman problem are you uh, if not it's okay uh, let's imagine that a sales person have to travel to five different cities and there are six different routes in which he has to travel imagine he has to take the smallest route into uh, travel from one city to another so this type of problem is called an optimization problem uh, in our <clears throat> common point of view as a common man we may not recognize how much uh, or is it important to us but let us consider the example of a giant marketing retailer like amazon they have to ship a product from one place to another so in order to do that they need to calculate the shortest route and considering that amazon serves around 180 countries in the world it's possible it's not possible to calculate a shortest route uh, if they take the shortest route they will save more money so uh, in order to optimize this path between two points we can use quantum computers and the reason before which i will tell you in the later session when we move on to how quantum computers work next is molecular modeling molecular modeling is nothing but drug design suppose that there is a new disease in order to uh, find a cure for the disease we need to first model the virus or simulate the virus so in order to simulate the virus we need to map each atom or each molecule that is present within the virus body in order for us to map that we can't use supercomputer the reason of because is that it takes a large amount of memory so uh, for example there are six atoms in a nucleus there are 6000 nucleuses in a cell uh, of an uh, virus just imagine it's not actually real so in order to do such a large computation uh, we cannot use even our most heavily equipped supercomputer and next is weather forecasting and climate prediction at the same reason we don't have uh, we can't use or like uh, uh, apply each parameter and evaluate that within a short point of time using a supercomputer it requires days or weeks within which the weather will have changed so that is one problem next is calculating prime number i hope you guys are familiar with the cryptography concept right like encryption and all yeah uh, so what happens is that in order to encrypt the data you start say take an algorithm such as sh sh requires first two prime numbers right to, to take two prime numbers and multiply them so in order to calculate these prime numbers in a truly random manner we can never do it with any computer that we have ever built the reason is that whatever the prime number or the random number that is generated by a computer program will always be regenerated that is you can regenerate it again because you are using an algorithm it is not actually a random number it's just a pseudo random number for a generating a pure random number that never occurs again like uh, it will not be repeated so in order to do that we need quantum computers next reason is simulation of atomic reaction similar to that of molecular modeling for all these reasons because of all these reasons we need quantum computers i hope that the session on why we need quantum computers is clear to you what is meant by a pseudo random number uh, okay so whenever we are writing a program say a python program to generate a random number we call the function random right so uh, i hope you are familiar with python and random if not just put it in the chat i'll yes okay so in order to uh, generate that random number we use an algorithm you know al the problem with algorithm is that the algorithm can repeatedly generate the same value it will never be a random number uh, you can try it if you want just give uh, just uh, try random a few number of times it will repeat the same number that it has given to you in the previous 
such numbers which are generated by algorithm using uh, that we take as a random number is called a zero random number i hope that it is clear okay okay so next we are moving on to the heart of the session which is what is a quantum computing and what what is a quantum computer so uh, let me tell you an interesting story uh, the inventor of chess so he uh, he was once invited to the court of the king and uh, the king very much liked this game and appreciated the inventor and asked him what he wants as a reward so he said that uh, for uh, every chess piece like there are 64 pieces right so every chess piece in the rice i want chess piece i want rice grains which are on the power of 2 so uh, the king agreed he didn't think too much into what is going to happen and in the first day it was just one rice to the power one right? it is uh, then it came became four then it became eight then it became 16 then 32 at last the king realized that by reaching to 64 uh, means he couldn't give that he realized that it at one point and uh, he said that he can't give that much rest that's a that's a that is a motivation behind quantum computing see in the normal computer when we add a bit what happens the processing power becomes twice so in the case of quantum computers that for every bit or a qubit in this case that we add to the system so uh, sorry so the for every qubit that i uh, add in the system what happens is that the power of processing becomes exponential that is it rises to the power of 2 suppose that you have 5 qubits it becomes the power of 2 raised to 5 then it becomes 2 raised to 10 2 raised to 16 and the magical number is 256 the reason is that when it becomes 256 the number of possible combinations or 2 raised to 256 would be almost equal to the size of the entire atom in this universe can you imagine that that is a very interesting concept so with that much amount of processing power we would be easily able to simulate very large complex calculations even predict the future <laughs> in one instance if you want to say and uh, that's one explanation of how the exponential power that is harnessed using quantum computer another example if you want to say let's take the case that you are trapped in a maze what do you do you would travel one path at a time try if it is the correct path if not you will come back then try another path with quantum computer that's also not just with you it's the same thing what classical computers do. but in the case of a quantum computer it just doesn't care about this what it does is that it travels all the paths at the same time because it can have that much power right uh, you can have uh, for example you can have uh, 16 qubits in your system and you can use that to generate two raised to 16 possible combinations so you can travel that many paths and find it then arrive at the answer with just one iteration while other algorithms require so many times traveling around to the maze and finding the answer that is the uh, power of exponentiality or what we are using to power our quantum computers next is an important piece of information called qubit so in our normal computers we have ones and zeros these ones and zeros are called bits what is what is a bit tell me guys what is a bit okay a bit is the smallest piece of information that can be stored in a computer so it can be yeah, either zero or one um like similar to bit what we have in quantum computers called a qubit but unlike a bit which can be zero or one a qubit can be both that is at the same time it can be zero and it can be one can you believe that 
something that is both zero and one at the same time. That is what makes quantum computers interesting. Because uh, imagine you have zero and one at the same time. How would you determine something like whether it is zero or one? In order to determine whether a qubit has zero or one, we measure the qubit. Like only upon measuring a qubit, it will arrive at the state. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, so I'm measuring a qubit. So what happens when you measure a qubit? You stop it for a moment. It is like uh, when you toss a coin, it goes into there. So it's a mixture of head and tails. You can't determine what it is until the coin lands in your hand. That is what happens when you take a qubit and put it into a system. So I hope what a qubit is is clear to you guys. Is it? Yes. If you have any questions, do post it in the chat box or uh, just say to me. Next, we are talking a bit depth in depth about what is quantum bits or how quantum computing works or things like that. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are some things that are weird. We are like, uh, it's not like what we think in our day to day life. It just happens to be happening at the smallest possible level within atoms or in the microscopic uh, realm, we can say. So there are two weird such phenomena called superposition and entanglement. Uh, first, we'll talk about what is superposition. So, as I said earlier, in the example of tossing a coin, unless the coin lands in your hand, you can't determine what it is. That is superposition. Now, where we will leverage this superposition is that we are having one qubit. So, what happens? We are having a head and a tail. So, we have two possible combinations. Now, we are having another qubit. What happens is we have uh, a a qubit having a either head or tail or zero or one and another qubit having zero or one. So what we can have, we can have eight possible different combinations. I mean, uh, sorry, four different possible combinations. With three, it becomes eight and with four, it becomes 16. It goes on like that. So this process of uh, in a continuous, this process of being in a continuous state of flux or having two states at the same time, this phenomenon is called superposition. Um, the, um, do we have any question regarding superposition? Because it's another important thing that you should know when you are going into the field of quantum computing or if you, someone asks you what a quantum computer is or how it works, you should know about this. No, you don't need, you don't use numbers basically in a, a quantum computer i'll talk in depth about how you're going to program a quantum computer or just show you what it is and it's not number system with base three there is no uh, like a fixed rule like that your processing power depends upon two to the ray power of n that just that okay i hope that's clear to you soham okay okay Next, we are moving into another phenomena called entanglement. Remember I said about the case of two coins, three coins and all. This is the main property that helps us to like, uh, accumulate all the qubits and throw them into a state of complete flux. Like you are having with each bit, you are having only two possible states. With a qubit, we can't do anything. We need a large number of qubits. So, we throw them into a pool and in order to uh, give these all different states, they need to be entangled or be like mixed up. That's what is called entanglement. Entanglement is uh, what helps us to run a quantum algorithm, a uh, quantum program, you can say. So uh, that is another important feature or the concept that happens in entanglement or 
the phenomena two weird phenomena that give rise or give birth to the quantum computing field the quantum the uh, another fact about quantum computing is that it's a relatively new field i uh, mean looking into the history of like say the trending fields right now like ai machine learning and all they had a very early beginning like in the 1945 there was ai can you believe that they were starting to talk about ai from that period but whatever happened in this quantum computing field it happened in the past 20 years there is nothing predating that except the postulates and theories that deal with quantum mechanics so it's a relatively new field and and it's not as like easy for someone to grasp this concept in one uh, session or something like this but it's something uh, it's must to be known uh, the reason is that while coming to another fields like ai machine learning or cyber security virtual reality and all we have we have heard about it we know what we can use some apps of uh, apps or something like that but in the case of quantum computing you don't have any kind of app or any some any like a platform for you to use or you are familiar with that so uh, that's about a bit of history about quantum computing now moving on to the field of quantum algorithms so what is a quantum algorithm so uh, like any algorithm it's basically a set of instructions given to a quantum computer to process but uh, unlike our uh, common program where you write print scan those those are not the things that we do here we use what is known as a quantum circuit i'll show you what is a quantum circuit in the next coming slide so uh, in order to write a program you can use python you can use python and a framework that is preferable that i would recommend if you are moving on to this field is qiskit which is an open source framework developed by ibm also there are other frameworks developed by google and also uh, tensorflow simulation called tensorflow quantum these are all the things that uh, uh, which we can work upon in when coming to this field so uh, quantum algorithm are essentially our algorithm but they are tuned to, to quantum computers and in this algorithm there is a condition that one of the steps that we are using in this algorithm should be either for posing super uh, superposition or for entanglement that is we have to write a step that throws the qubits into a superposition or entanglement and do you have any question regarding this session on quantum algorithms okay okay then we are moving on to the next thing the type of quantum computers uh, similar to classical computers we have personal computers uh, workstations servers supercomputers there are basically three type of quantum computers one is a quantum annealer then comes an analog quantum computer then comes the universal quantum computer so uh, let me take an analogy or an example like uh, say we have voice recognition uh, softwares that use ai but the thing is that we can't say that they are ai they are just doing a specific task and they are really good at it it's not that they are not good at it they are good at it but they are good at just a specific task the quantum analysts are similar to that they are just good at solving one problem that is the optimization problem they were the earliest or the first models of quantum computers to be built and they were developed by a company called d wave so uh, it's not to say that they are not uh, weak uh, see i the weak in terms of the type of quantum computers like weaker section of a quantum computer but they are actually more better than our supercomputers in just one issue the optimization problem 
in rather checking an email you can't check an email on a quantum quantum email you can't write a mail on a quantum computer you can't watch a video on a quantum email okay i hope quantum annular is clear to you in the picture there you can see that um, that is a system by d wave Uh, moving on to the next session. What is an analog quantum computer? So, the quantum computers that exist today are essentially what we can say quantum annulus. So, uh, what quantum annulus? Uh, I mean, uh, analog quantum. Sorry, analog quantum computers. They are faster than our traditional computers in doing many tasks, not just optimization problem. They can do problems in simulating chemistry, material science, dynamics. Weather forecasting, optimization problems also, and most of the companies that are focusing on quantum computers like um, yeah, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Getty, Honeywell, Alibaba, INQ, they all are building what is known as an analog quantum computers. So there is a size restriction on this category of quantum computers. We can have only. Around uh, 100 to 300 type of uh, qubits per, uh, like uh, it can range from tens to hundreds. That is the range of qubits that are included in this category of analog quantum computers, and they are the ones which are available to us right now. Moving on to the next category of quantum computers, which is a universal quantum computer. So. Uh, this universal quantum computer is similar to what we can call a general AI that is uh, an AI that is capable of doing all tasks not just natural language processing or image recognition or some other tasks uh, like you yeah, can say that it is good at everything so uh, one of the most leading players in in developing universal quantum computers is IBM IBM has invested very large amount of resource money on developing universal quantum computers. So uh, the problem with developing a quantum computer is that you can have qubits. That is not the problem. But when we add qubits more than 53 qubits into a system, it causes a lot of errors. It's not to say that there are others uh, in computers less than uh, quantum computers less than 53 qubits. There are, but the errors also become exponential to a point that we can't contain it uh, but there are companies developing ways like Argetti and uh, IBM also has computers with hundreds of qubits so in the journey to the ultimate quantum computer that is the universal quantum computer it has more than 100,000 or 1 lakh qubits and it will be the ultimate aim of developing a quantum computer or where we have to reach to get that capable processing capability to calculate what I said future and all. So I hope the session is clear. If you have any questions do post it in the chat. Okay. I know that this is not uh, yeah I can share the PPT if you want. Uh, this will not be some interesting to you guys because this is full of theory and stuff so uh, that's a bit of problem because i can't show you a demo of a game developed by using a quantum computer but i'll show you some examples of course and actually how we how the quantum computers are programmed and stuff like that you have to be bear a bit more because uh, this uh, this uh, producing qubits topic is very important um, I can't say that these are the ways uh, of producing qubits now because there is a lot of research going on this field. In order to produce qubits, there are two basic approaches. One is by using superconductor method and the other one is trapped ion method. So uh, these both methods have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, let me begin with superconducting method. This superconducting method is basically used in most of the analog quantum computers that we use today the you know that what do you guys know what a superconductor is i forgot about that mm, 
okay i'll explain what a superconductor is so uh, when when we lower the temperature of some material like say for example iron 3 iron 3 ferrite what happens is that approaching to very low temperature it shows zero resistivity such materials are called superconductors that is the current flows through it without any restriction that is there is no wastage of current flowing through that conductor like uh, for example if you hold the end of a pipe while water is passing there is restriction that is a normal uh, normal condition like when we are passing electricity through copper wire there is heat loss that occurs due to this problem but what happens is that when we lower the temperature to extremely low temperature like approaching to zero kelvin the resistivity drops so down that there is no wastage of energy such type of technology is used to produce superconducting uh, qubits in superconducting method what we do here is that we take superconductors cool it down to very low temperature approaching to around 0 kelvin or in fact you can say that in ibm conductors it is approximately 0.4 kelvin that is around 150 times more colder than space imagine the amount of cold or coldness there is they do it by using liquid nitrogen if you have seen uh, the videos about food like they freeze up on pouring liquid nitrogen the same material we are using here also so uh, we will produce qubits using that method what happens is that uh, we take a superconductor cool it down to a very low temperature we leave points of superconductors like uh, end connecting end points at a particular point uh, the touching two superconductors that point is called uh, josephson junction so let me show you what so i hope you can see this section right can you guys see this this point this point yes sir yeah, uh, i can't come to this like ppt then go back to uh, chat to check so if I, it would be very good if someone could just answer yes sir sure sir so this point this point is called a josephson junction so what happens is that when we pass current through this superconductor and cooled it to very low temperature it ejects and at like a positively charged ion will be ejected from this point and sorry ejected from this point and that ion becomes our qubit so it will be how this is how we produce qubits in superconducting method next is the ion trap method so uh, the ion trap method is actually i think more efficient when compared to superconducting method because here what we happens is that we don't have to cool it to very low temperature we don't have to handle all this uh, cooling equipment and uh, and all the critical problems that come with it superconductors what we do is that we take calcium uh, the specialty with calcium is that it has one just one ion in its outer orbit so what we do is that we bombard that calcium ion with laser beams so what uh, so these laser beam precisely strike the outer orbit and throw that positively charged ion this ion which is moved from the atom is caught by using an electric field and we store this uh, these ions in a chamber electric field chamber that is why we call it trapped ion method okay so in this method also generates heat it's not that they are not generating heat the laser produces heat uh, but it's less as compared it, it, the cooling required is less as compared to that of superconducting method but google and ibm develop systems based on superconducting method another problem with superconducting method is that qubits have a very little lifetime like 
the instance that you produce the qubit, you have to calculate or do something with it. Otherwise, it gets destroyed in the superconducting method. So, in order to manipulate data, one of the problem with uh, quantum computers right now is that if you produce a qubit and you don't utilize it, it gets destroyed. Or you can't store the data that you calculated in qubit form. You have to convert it into normal bit and store it somewhere in the memory. So I hope this part of producing qubits is clear to you guys. Yes, sir, it's clear. Yes, sir. Do you have any questions? Uh, any questions? Okay. So we'll now watch a video in the uh, what, what happens in IBM quantum computer. Welcome to one of our quantum computing labs. Right over here is one of our dilution refrigeration systems which actually cool down our superconducting qubit devices. There are a number of different plates inside here uh, which all sit at different temperatures. And that gets down all the way to 15 millikelvin. Now that's colder than outer space itself. The sound you hear is actually a pulse tube compressor which essentially is pumping on a closed cycle of helium-4 helium which helps us get the system cold. We have a lot of other equipment that we use in order to run the processors. So there's a lot of uh, microwave ha hardware, different passive components, including filters and attenuators, uh, as well as coax cables, which allow us to send the signals down to address the qubits and to read them out, giving us the controllability. This is a four qubit package. Uh, we have a five qubit device that's right now inside of the fridge, but uh, the general idea for how we actually package up these devices and cool them down is the same. And uh, this is a printed circuit board uh, to which we mount our, our, our qubit chips um, and we wire bond to them to connect to, the, to essentially these uh, coaxial pins. And these coaxial pins connect to cables which are inside of the fridge to allow us to send the signals down and to take signals back and read them out. I hope you guys have seen that video. So, you guys do have any doubt which, is, uh, which method is most economical method. See, uh, with quantum computing, uh, nothing is clear. Like, we don't have an accurate measurement or a result about which method is better than which. It depends on how you're going to implement, how you're going to profit from that. Like in the case of IBM and Google, they are actually selling these machines, like not as a machine as a whole, as a service. So they can earn more money from that. But in the case of a uh, research firm, such as DWIP, or uh, no, we can't consider DWIP, DWIP was also in business. So Ragetti, and they do this trap down method because it's more efficient. But uh, there are researchers going on in semiconductor field, like, you know, without having to cool this to a low temperature or without even having to um, uh, laserize these atoms, we can use semiconductors like the chips that we use in our computers to produce qubits. So uh, I can't recommend which is the most economical method. It depends on your implementation. I hope it's clear to you, Rich. So, I thought I would give you guys this hands-on into IBM quantum computer and share you. How can, I'll tell you how you can access a quantum computer right now at your home. I hope the screen is visible. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, in order to access a quantum computer, all you have to do is take an IBM account and go to computing quantumcomputing.ibm.com. That's it. You will get a quantum computer. But just having a quantum computer at your fingertips doesn't mean that you can work on it. What you can do is, or how you are going to start working on a quantum computer is by creating a quantum algorithm as I create, told you before. Uh, let me launch uh, quantum circuit and show you. Okay, 
Is this screen visible to us? Yes, sir. So uh, when you click um, uh, like the launch composer on the other window that I've shown, right? Uh, this button, uh, you can see the launch composer, right? Yes, sir. And click this button, you will get what is called IBM's quantum composer. Normally, um, I hope all of you are from computer science branch. If so, we write programs using a certain language on a, our ID or say notepad and we compile them and run them. But it's not the same when it comes to a quantum computer. What happens is that here you can program the quantum computer without having any knowledge about programming. I'm not going into details about how you can do that because that is that will take you months or years to even master or even and get to know basics of the thing. I show you what it is. These these things which you can see on the screen right now, uh, like this H, the plus sign and all, those are what you call gates or quantum gates. These quantum gates are used to manipulate our qubits. Like, uh, can you see a Q0, Q1 and all here, right? Yes, sir. So these uh, are what you can't call qubits. These are uh, the qubits that are available to you. Right now, uh, I'm using the San Diego, uh, IBM San Diego quantum computer. It has five qubits available to you. And uh, it's just measuring the qubit, what the qubit is, and storing that value in um, in a register. The C is called, C's are registers and Q's are called quantum bits. In this composer, don't worry about these things. These are all for those who are interested in programming and other stuff. Just I wanted to show you how this works. So once you have created a circuit by, let's say putting some gates and creating some circuits, you can get an output like here there is a sphere. Right? You can get a, an output like uh, this will show you what the output is like it can be either in a state of zero zero one. here it is showing that it can be a state of zero zero one or in the state of zero 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 with a probability of 50 rupees and oh, in order to run just click the run button and it will run and uh, it will take some time because these quantum computers are aware many people are using it from all over the world so i can show you an example that i've run here and this is an example which I have run here. I, I did it before and it took around seven minutes to run this code, uh, run this. So the simple code, it will take that time. So it, uh, see the actual output for the program should be zero, 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 zero and nothing else. But it gave me a probability of 0.8 percentage or 8 percentage for 0 0.01 and 0, 0, 0.010 0, also 8 percentage. The reason why this occurs is called the error factor because uh, even though we claim that uh, in actuality what we have to get is a hundred like just this bar we got this too because of the error that in occurs in quantum computer that is why i have said previously that quantum computers are error prone even without having uh, like a massive number of qubits it has errors this is one of the major problems that we are tackling now uh, to uh, get back into like you know, these are what researchers are focusing on right now to reduce the error that occurs in quantum computer. Because even though we have 53 qubits, we can't use them. We need to donate some of the qubits for uh, like chasing the errors and uh, making changes in the uh, errors and all those factors. To account for those errors, we need to donate some qubits. Next, I'll show you. how quantum computing helps us or what are the uses of quantum computer how we can improve from the quantum computer like what are the general areas that we are focusing on so AI and machine learning uh, in order to arrive at that goal of a general AI it's time to say that it will take tens of tens of years the reason because is that we don't have such a complex computational power to train AI models that are general. So quantum computers with their enormous logarithmic or K 
can say exponential processing power can simplify this task and make AI model training and machine learning faster, more accurate, and also more prone to errors as compared to models that we train right now. And this quantum A is a program that is launched by Google. It uses Google's own proprietary Sagamore chip for training models. Actually, uh, one of the problem with this is that Google doesn't provide others like professionals or uh, outsiders access to the outer quantum. Like they don't provide access to their quantum computers, just enterprise. They don't give access to public. That's why uh, everyone is pushing towards IBM's Qiskit framework. And if you go to the Qiskit site, Qiskit Q I S K I P, uh, those sites, you can learn about quantum computers free of charge. You have many tutorials. There will be many people to help you in the Qiskit community. And if you are starting to uh, explore this area, that would be very great. Uh, going into Qiskit dot org, I will be very grateful for you. And uh, moving on to our next area, that is computational chemistry. So, imagine we had a quantum computer, a universal quantum computer today. We are in the midst of a pandemic for the last two years. This would have never happened, you know. A quantum computer can actually simulate the coronavirus easily. Mm, in the initial areas, initial days of uh, corona outbreak, there was a project called uh, folding. Project folding. What project folding was tried to do is using all the resources and supercomputers to simulate this virus, to study it and how we can uh, find a cure or vaccine to prevent ourselves from this disease. But if we had quantum computers, we could simulate this virus within an instant and would have prevented it from spreading. So that's an area of research. You can develop medicines for diseases before even they are spread to the masses and all such things. Next thing is cyber security and cryptography. This is one of my area uh, interest area. The reason is that have you heard about Shor's algorithm? I hope. I think you have not. Uh, the reason because is that the entire field of quantum computing uh, research was pioneered by this algorithm. Like uh, the entire business model of uh, quantum computing was focused on this algorithm. What drove many people uh, to make a quantum computer into a reality was this algorithm. So I have to talk a lot about algorithm. What that algorithm basically does is that it can break your encryption. Like uh, it can break your SHA, it can break your RSA. It can entirely damage the security of the entire internet network because we focus on prime numbers. The reason is that these algorithms start with the prime number. And uh, in order to get up or in order to decrypt a message, you need a private key of a person. So in order to uh, you know that in uh, SHA or RSA, we generate a public key and private key for encryption, right? So in order to decrypt an encrypted message, you need the private key. The reverse engineering process of this RSA or uh, in order to create, you can easily create uh, from private key, public key, but vice versa is not possible. In order to, why it is not possible? Because it, took, it takes computationally very long time. Like it takes tens of thousands of years if you have to do the reverse process. Shows algorithm says that or it makes this thing possible uh, within seconds. The reason is that it uses quantum computing to reverse engineer the key. And it is an area of key research and and uh, another field has even developed with the security field. It's called post-quantum cryptography or uh, what type of cryptography measures we are going to take when quantum computers come into field. So that is another area where we can improve because it's not just breaking. Quantum computer also gives you a key new another system called quantum cryptography. Quantum cryptography is one of the safest ways because uh, in order to uh, like in order for someone to uh, grab your data, or you need they need to have your private key, right? So for example, someone is tapping and using a
data changes between them they will get to know that there is someone trying to manipulate the data so they can easily identify it that is an advantage of content cryptography moving on to the next topic will be weather forecasting as i have told earlier weather forecasting requires a very large number of parameters like what is the humidity what is the moisture content what is the climate what is the temperature all micro variation pressure all these factors it will take a large amount of and in order to process petabytes of data supercomputers even require time but with the exponential processing power of a quantum computer it might be very simple and within uh, seconds you can process this data and uh, like tsunami like unlike tsunami one is that come within hours before the disaster you can get with excel and accuracy results and uh, easily avoid disasters from happening any uh, doubts or questions please or paste it in the chat box is it clear yes sir so uh, you may be thinking where we are applying this quantum computers he this guy has been talking for uh, an hour about quantum computers we don't know what to do with quantum computers so i'll show you a video about how benz is using quantum computers Mercedes-Benz has been moving people and goods around the planet for over 130 years now. Every day we ask ourselves, how can we bring the future into reality? This is at the heart of who we are, and this can only be achieved by continuously innovating. Right now, our industry is in a transition to a new age. It's time to reduce our impact on the planet. Our goal is for the entire Mercedes-Benz vehicle fleet to be carbon neutral by 2039. That means implementing electric driving in all divisions as a priority. For that, we need to focus on next generation battery technology. The thing that has always held battery technology back, and this will sound strange, is that we don't really know what goes on inside of batteries. This thing is a mystery. Sure, we know how to make batteries, but we can't actually see what's happening at a molecular level inside the battery while it's working. A battery is more like a complex ecosystem than a machine that spits out electricity. It's chaos in there. And to make things even harder, there isn't a supercomputer on the planet right now that could accurately simulate what's going on in there either. Simulating this at the molecular level of detail involves accounting for a tremendous number of electron interactions, each electron influencing the other in complex ways. Accurately simulating electron interactions in the simplest molecules takes many days on the most powerful supercomputers on the planet. And as for the reactions in a battery, forget it. So what we have to do is approximate the chemical reactions in a battery using classical algorithms. They're not very good and average out a lot of reactions and make a lot of assumptions, but they're all we have. So designing more efficient batteries is a laborious process of trial and error that takes decades. Mercedes-Benz has turned to IBM Quantum to explore how we can simulate the chemical reactions in batteries more accurately. IBM Quantum computers are built with quantum mechanical systems at their heart. They are designed to simulate quantum systems such as chemical reactions far more efficiently than classical supercomputers. With these simulations, we're exploring new materials to create more efficient batteries. At Mercedes-Benz, we continue to advance our development of current and future high-performance lithium-ion batteries, but also have a close look at what's beyond lithium-ion. We strive to explore cutting-edge technologies for our customers in support of the high-volume electrification for our entire model portfolio. Today, IBM already has over 20 quantum computers running across the world. 
running over 1 billion executions a day on the IBM cloud. We've opened this technology up so everyone can sign up and experiment with it. So far, that means over 300,000 users. Simulating the actual behavior of a battery using quantum computing could unlock a remarkable opportunity. We need new ways to solve problems that we previously couldn't tackle. And with quantum computing, we're on our way. So to summarize uh, what the quantum computer is and what we have learned uh, in this session is that a quantum computer can help us to solve complex problems that are otherwise impossible to solve by using classical computers. They use what is called the, the weirdness of quantum mechanics, that is superposition and entanglement to achieve uh, further like, uh, very high processing capability. And also, we have learned that qubits are the basic important information processing blocks of a quantum computer. And uh, with that, I conclude my session and uh, thanking all those who have given an opportunity for me to give share my knowledge with you guys. And I hope that you have understood at least something about quantum computing and why it's important and what it to our future and also for our sustainability and growth. If you have any queries, please turn. Thank you, sir. Participants, if you have any queries, please type them into the chat box. I think you, we have covered all the questions. Thank you, sir. So let's move on to the word of thanks. It's my honor and privilege to propose a word of thanks on behalf of IEEE MASP to all those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this webinar. At the outset, I thank our resource person, Mr. Mahesh Babu, for presenting such a wonderful and informative webinar on quantum computing. I extend my deep gratitude for taking out time from your busy schedule and enlightening us with the knowledge. Thank you very much, sir. And also a heartfelt thanks to all participants for attending this webinar. The event has come to an end. Participants can now leave the meeting window. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank my sir. It was a great presentation and I learned a lot from this. It was really knowledgeable. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, Parag. Thank you. The participants can leave the meeting window. Aromal, could you please end the meeting for me? Stop the recording and please end the meeting. <laughs>